Have Iraq's police been killing civilians under the guise of fighting Daesh? Troubling new reports out of Mosul have Iraq's government launching an investigation into its own security personnel. I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmakers are Iraqi forces in Mosul. Their mission is to free Mosul from Daesh, but the country's special police force now faces accusations that it has used the operation to torture, rape and kill civilians. A hailstorm of criticism followed a report with photos published in Der Spiegel. The magazine's reporter befriended and then travelled with the elite fighting force, first believing he would be covering the heroism of his fellow Iraqis. Instead, his article is titled, Not Heroes, but Monsters. That reporter, Ali Arkadi, says he witnessed troops attack civilians during raids. Women were raped and men would be taken outside the city away from foreign press and executed. If true, are these renegade soldiers or is this a tactic being used by the military? I'll pose those questions to our panel in just a moment. But first, let's get the conversation started with this report by Natalie Pohonen. The fight to free Mosul and its people from Daesh has been one of the Iraqi security forces' biggest battles. Thousands of civilians have been lifted from living under their rule. But now there are allegations that some of the city's so-called liberators are also to be feared. Der Spiegel published a harrowing account by embedded photojournalist Ali Arkadi. He photographed beatings and the torture of men and teenagers in and around Mosul suspected of having ties to Daesh. He says a soldier boasted one torture method was a technique they learned from American experts. Arkady says they had lost all standards for what is right and what is wrong. The Iraqi forces and various militia groups fighting to defeat Daesh are backed by the US-led coalition. Brett McGurk is the United States' special presidential envoy for the global coalition to counter ISIS. He was in Mosul earlier in May. He's now tweeted this. Iraqi forces have bravely placed civilian protection as a top priority throughout the Mosul campaign, at great risk to their own personnel. Individuals or units failing to uphold that standard do a disservice to their sacrifice and must be investigated and held accountable. The Iraqi Interior Ministry says it will investigate the claims. It's not the first time that the ministry or members of the nation's paramilitary forces have been accused of retaliation, torture and killings of Sunni civilians suspected of collaborating with or supporting Daesh. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have both alleged the government has carried out serious human rights violations against the Iraqi people. In the drive to defeat and destroy Daesh, will these latest allegations be a severe setback for the government and its supporters? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, let's meet our panel. Joining me now from Baghdad is Saad al-Muttalibi. He's a member of the Baghdad Security Committee and former political advisor to the Iraqi government. In Beirut, we're joined by retired Lebanese Army General Hisham Jaber. And, of course, we have Talha Abdul Razak, who's joining us from London as well. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Let me begin with you, Saad al-Muttalibi. This was an unsettling Der Spiegel report. Some nasty pictures. Are Iraqi forces abusing, torturing, raping, executing prisoners? Um, thank you very much. And I'm really surprised. We're here in Baghdad. We're very surprised for such a, a notable German uh, media uh, defends ISIS in such a way and accuse a democratic government that was elected democratically and formed and a national army to accuse that national army of such atrocities and uh, covering pictures that were taken over a year ago from Syria, not from Iraq. And uh, we have also a, a experts who managed to find uh, the said pictures that were uh, um, 
shown in Syria, nothing to do with Iraq. The report was fabricated in such a way that accuses the Iraqi army that actually stopped or made a very slow progress in the liberation of uh, Mosul due to the presence of civilians. So Since me, we couldn't sure. manage to... Let, let me come in, let me ask you, right? In World War II, the Nazis were terrible. They were awful. But you had some Allied soldiers executing German POWs and so on. That didn't mean that the Nazis then had the moral victory. That didn't mean that the Nazis won. That didn't mean anything. It didn't hand them anything. Those people were court-martialed and they were dealt with. Why is it so hard to accept that maybe Der Spiegel has something solid here? We have this guy, Ali Arkadi, who said he went to follow up on these heroes and he came out with stuff that shocked him. He didn't actually want to release it. Why is it so difficult to believe that maybe in a, in a good, just fight, sometimes terrible things can happen? Why don't you root out those terrible people who are doing that instead of being in denial, sir? No, we're not in denial. We have, with every battalion, there is a, a recording of every movement of the soldiers. Because we had this problem in the beginning of the uh, military attack on ISIS, there were events that uh, soldiers took justice in their own hands. So the government decided to provide cameras, recordings, with every uh, group of soldiers that move forward. It's very difficult now for soldiers to commit any type of atrocity without being recorded. So, therefore, it's quite difficult. It's not a matter of denial. It's very difficult. It will need a great deal of uh, planning, organizing to commit such an atrocity. Okay, and so before, I, before I bring in the other guests, let me give you one more example, right? So forget Der Spiegel, you say... Yeah. This was fabricated. You say it's a German newspaper that's supporting ISIS. Let's forget them for a second. Al Arabi, the new Arab out of London. They were on patrol with Iraqi forces. They were with a bunch of foreign journalists who didn't speak Arabic. The Iraqi forces didn't know that one of the journalists was from the new Arab who spoke Arabic. The journalist says the soldiers and commanders spoke openly about looting homes, abusing civilians. Afterwards, interviewed an Iraqi police officer who said, and I quote, they are crimes and violations I am too ashamed to mention. Bodies of young men who had been detained can be found in the streets at night, and sadistic torture is carried out inside houses by army forces and militias. Homes and shops are also looted. So is Al-Arabi, the new Arab, also supporting ISIS and lying about the Iraqi government? No, these events, I said, these events happened in the beginning of the onslaught on ISIS. And due to the uh, news that uh, arrived to the Iraqi government, Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Interior issued certain instructions to try to eliminate but they're saying it's or happening reduce now. such... No, this is, what, this is the argument. I don't believe that these things are happening now because unless, unless we are dealing with ISIS, yes, we kill ISIS. If we capture an ISIS, we do kill them. Right, but these they, people are is, suspects. Uh, uh, that's, that's the point. They're suspects and they're being tortured. No, we suspects. don't know if they're ISIS or not. We have 10,000 prisoners now, suspected ISIS collaborators. They are officially registered. They are sitting in our prisons. Otherwise, if we did that, otherwise there wouldn't be any, any suspected prisoners. Uh, therefore, we have 10,000 of those. We have 4,000 dead ISIS uh, uh, fighters in the, um, on the uh, right side of, uh, sorry, the left side, uh, supposedly, of okay. Mosul, the liberated side. And uh, we have, uh, four, as I said, 4,000 dead bodies. And we have over uh, 7,000 between Salah ad and Mosul. So ISIS fighters, are, they are killed. Okay. But suspected ISIS collaborators, they go to prison. Okay, so you're they saying they're trial. not being... Okay, fair enough. So you're saying the suspected ISIS collaborators are not being tortured, not being raped, not being executed. Talha Abdul Razak, do you believe that? Not at all. And in fact, the uh, gentleman from Baghdad just admitted that, you know, when they capture ISIS fighters, they execute them. He said, we, we kill them. Of course we Well, do. I'm sorry, you know, that's of an open tacit... Ad what, you're just admitting that you're breaching international law. You're capturing enemy fighters. <laughs> you're supposed to put them on trial. 
yes, you can laugh all you want, but um, uh, according to everyone else, they, they are, are still enemy they fighters. Are they have to be put before a judge. They are terrorists. They have to be put by, before. Yes, okay, they're, a, they're okay, terrorists. They be put for, before yep. a judge. Yep. So they let's, are let's put get before clarity, a judge. <laughs> let's get clarity. Tried, Saad al uh, and executed. Hold on, uh, Talha, just for a second. Saad al Mutalabi, are you saying they're being killed in firefights, in actual battles, or that they're being captured and then executed? Because this is a crucial difference. Because the executions against the Geneva Conventions. Uh, of course, first of all, they are terrorists. They are not a fight. They are not a foreign fighting forces. They no, do not on. belong to an. Uh, Is it during an firefights army. or when first they're captured? Of all, so when they they are killed in firefights or when they resist arrest or they resist surrender, they are naturally killed with no mercy. Uh, okay. But as a prisoner, if they fall prisoners uh, of war, I mean prisoners in our hand, there's no need uh, to kill them. Okay, we so just, let's ask. You know, okay. take them into custody. Fair enough. Okay, so you clarified it. Is that clarification enough for you, Talha? Uh, not at all. I mean, he just said if they surrender, uh, they're killed without mercy. And to have, you know, to issue an order to execute prisoners uh, and you know to show no quarter is actually mentioned in international law. It's, it's actually a war crime to do that. So irrespective of whether they're terrorists or not, they're put before a judge with a fair trial, and we all know what the Iraqi judiciary is like on that account, and should they be found guilty, then they are punished by the law of the land, which is naturally okay. an execution. Okay, so let's you bring in Hisham Jabir. You can't prisoners and execute sure. them. Okay, Hisham Jabir, do you believe that this is policy or that th while some of it might be true, that might, these might be rotten apples within the Iraqi army? Which one is it? No, I don't know. I cannot. Uh, nobody can deny. Nobody, nobody can prove this under the investigation. A real, honest, and neutral investigation will happen. Uh, let me tell you something. I heard you uh, guess it. First of all, violation of international laws. It happened in the past and the present. It happened in uh, South Lebanon when uh, the Israeli did occupy 22 years, especially in Khiyam. Uh, prison. It happened in Baghdad and Abu Ghraib when the American forces did violate uh, the, the, the international law and uh, torture and uh, etc. and the rape even. Uh, what we learned from Baghdad, this is Derich Begel, and uh, last week was published the testimony of a uh, photograph. We are not sure, we cannot deny, we cannot say that true. And second, we hear today that uh, the Minister of Interior, Iraqi Minister of Interior, Mr. Qasim, ordered to open an investigation and insist, right. to be honest, you know, to see what happened, if really it happened, you know, and if you see in the war, you know, and maybe, maybe it's true, the only, uh, you know, the end uh, of the story, uh, if the, it's happened or not, uh, yeah, we can have it, you know, if we make right. a international, let's say, okay. a neutral investigation made by a, a, yani a committee which, uh, uh, you know, has good reputation. Mr. Jabir, and General also, Jabir, do you, trust, time, do you that, trust the Iraqis to investigate themselves, sir? Uh, I think if I do trust, maybe others, they don't. So to convince everyone in right. the whole world, let me tell you something. It happened everywhere, and if we want to stop this kind of crime of war, we call them, which is against the international law, and which is against even the Islam rules, you know, uh, because I heard your, uh, your guest from Baghdad, he said, we kill, uh, uh, we kill ISIS uh, prisoner. No, it's against the... Uh, Prisoner of war, uh, okay. POW, is not supposed to okay, be killed. Okay, good point. So let's and ask. Second, so, I mean, sure. if we want to make, if we want to make the first milestone for to, to solve this problem, the first step, I think we have to start now, not tomorrow. Okay, to good make point. a real Fair investigation enough. and to punish and to publish the punishment to everyone in the world. Okay, so Saad al Mutalabi. Hisham Jabir is not happy with your claim that they're terrorists and they deserve to be killed. If somebody's a prisoner of war, you don't execute them. And secondly, he's saying allow for an international inter investigation, even if he trusts the Iraqi government to investigate itself. Maybe others don't. And that's a fair point that he makes, isn't it? So maybe allow in impartial uh, investigators. 
Iraq is a country with, with full sovereignty. Turkish planes every other day attack northern Iraq and kill suspected PKK terrorists. So uh, should Turkey be, be also put on trial? How about, how about I Turkey invite you on to, to discuss the Turkey PKK uh, topic? On that day, I'll uh, invite for example, you. We'll do it. No, I'm right? just... Okay, yeah. cool. You Please didn't. Continue. You didn't invite me. But I am saying, as an example, uh, people in northern Iraq have been killed by foreign airplanes. And why did they kill them? Why didn't they take them prisoners? Because they were terrorists. Now, if we kill terrorists in Iraq, Iraq is a country of full sovereignty, democratically elected government and army. Therefore, Iraq can, claim, can study any claim of violation, can investigate that claim, with an independent justice system and uh, uh, release any findings, see, whatever they may be. This is fascinating, Mr. Al Mutalibi, because you know you spoke about some of the stuff that happened in the past, and it was awful stuff that happened in the past. You had in 2015 with Hashtar yes. Shabi, the Iranian-backed forces, villages were ethnically cleansed. Amnesty International had some awful reports that came out about what had happened under the guise of fighting Daesh. And again, Daesh are terrible. Everybody agrees. But then there were also Sunnis who got caught up in this and they were killed, they were displaced and so on. You, you're, you're admitting that that was wrong. But on the other hand, you're saying, hey, those are bad guys. They're terrorists. They deserve to die. How can you be so sure that you're not hitting the wrong people? No, it's very obvious. ISIS people are known. We have the databases of all ISIS members. I have it myself, the database. Therefore, I mean, there is no reason to punish an innocent people and create an enemy from people who were uh, victims of ISIS. Okay, so when we talk about let the me Sunnis, ask you the other the way Sunnis around. Sunnis were the most people. Sure. Let me yeah. ask you the other yeah. way around. You say yeah. they are ISIS, suspected ISIS prisoners. Has anybody been a suspected ISIS prisoner and then been released because you didn't find any, any dirt on them or you didn't find them linked to ISIS? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Hundreds. Hundreds, okay. not one or two. Okay. We're talking about uh, uh, thousands in Salahuddin, in Tikrit province, okay, so who were released completely. Okay, so let me yes. pose so that to Talha. No, there's no need sure. to create enemies. Okay, let yeah. me pose that to Talha. Talha, they are those who are suspected of being... Daesh, and then they're released because there's no evidence. Talha? Well, I mean, we keep coming back to this point, and uh, many analysts have been talking about this, as well as human rights activists. 643 men and boys went missing from Saglawiya, which is near Fallujah. This is just about a year ago now, when Fallujah was being, you know, liberated, as they say, I say recaptured. <clears throat> And where have these people gone? They keep talking about these investigations, these inquiries, and these independent tribunals. There has been no tribunal. Uh, Amnesty International said um, that they've been trying to get in touch with the Iraqi government to get an update on what's been going on with these inquiries, and they've just been stonewalled. They've not heard a thing. The reason being is because everyone assumes and presumes that these 643 men in this one area alone, and you know, bearing in mind this has happened in Baqoba and other right. places, 643 men have just vanished off the face of the earth. So I'm not sure what the gentleman from Baghdad's talking about. And we have another point as well that we need to get to grips with. When he keeps talking about democratically elected country, and he mentioned a democratic army, there's no such thing as a democratic army. That's not how battlefields work. And he's talking about Turkey bombing terrorists. That's a long-range engagement. But when you've got boots on the ground, rounding up people, taking them to torture chambers, and brutally executing them, and this has been documented now, and you know he's saying it's the, the footage is from Syria. Where's his evidence that that's been the case? Um, we've never seen anything like this. Okay. So it's, frankly, it's fanciful, it's unbelievable, and it's incoherent. Okay, I want to just broaden this out before we wrap up because we are running out of time, and I want to make use of the experience of the retired General Hisham Jaber here. We saw last month a video come out out of Egypt right, purporting to come out of Egypt. You, you, you spoke about these sort of crimes of war, war crimes happening all over the region, and we saw this horrible video uh, which purported to come out of Egypt, which showed uh, Egyptian soldiers allegedly executing those who they deemed Daesh, alleged Daesh. And these were kids. They looked like teenagers, right? So you, see, you have them roughing them up, and then them executed as well. I want to ask you if you think, uh, Hisham Jaber, if... What we're seeing across the region right now, from Iraq to Syria to Egypt and so on, is armies playing fast and loose with the law, 
playing fast and loose with international law, because Daesh is so bad, they're just using this as an excuse to wipe out whoever they want to wipe out, and the rules of engagement are really awful right now because we're hearing about these stories more and more. What do you think, sir? Daesh, no one, uh, you know, no problem. No one can say that it's not a terrorist. Daesh made, a, you know, incredible, you know, crimes. Uh, but uh, at the same time, if you fight Daesh, you have the right to shell Daesh, to kill Daesh in the battlefield. But uh, since anyone from Daesh is, you know, surround and become a prisoner of war, you don't have the right to kill him, whether in Egypt or mm -hmm. in Iraq or wherever. Uh, it's the international law. This is the Islam as rules of the Islam, as I said. But but who can control this? You know, I don't know if those films from Egypt are true or you know uh, or not true. And especially your guest uh, Talhat, I believe, or Talhat, you know, said uh, something very very important and very dangerous. Uh, he made a lot of accusation, and uh, those are a matter of investigation. You cannot also, you know, something very, very important. Uh, we have to stop about it and also to start to investigate. Now we are talking about a few uh, men, few civilian has been, you know, uh, filmed or taken photos from a photograph. Who gave it to the Dutch Spiegel and Dutch Spiegel did publish it and what happened? There are hundreds of those cases. Nobody can see it because they are not photographed. You know, they are not under, there are no witnesses. Wherever it is, I think, I think, and the international, I mean, the international committee, the United Nations, must be neutral and move from day one and make the first milestone, you know, to uh, solve, to correct, you know, uh, this way, which has happened everywhere in the world. And now, if any re government, any officer, any commander is responsible, in my opinion, one, it, he is punished, whether he is Israeli, he is American, he is Iraqi, he is Egyptian, he is wherever he is, he must, you know, his punishment, the sanction must be well known for the, the whole world. Now, we don't, we don't have any lack of mass media or social media. I mean, Indeed. any incident could be plushed all over the world. Yes, and, and I'll let that be the final word. I mean, that's what I'm trying to yes, say. Yes, it is true that these images and videos inflame tensions, but you know, cover ups make things even worse. So we're trying to get to the bottom of it. We hope we can. It's been important to have this conversation. Talha Abdul Razak, Saad Al Mutalabi, and Hisham Jabir, thank you all for joining us. Coming up on the program, could Catalans break away from Spain without a referendum? And will a new round of peace talks end a decades-long war in Myanmar? We'll tell you why many are skeptical. It could be a nuclear option that leads to the breakup of Spain. The semi-autonomous region of Catalonia wants a referendum to declare its independence. But blocking the way is the federal government, judges, and nationalist protesters. And Catalan leaders are saying enough. It's being reported that if a vote doesn't happen in September, there'll be no more protests, no more court cases. Catalonia will unilaterally secede. Observers say that could spark a national crisis in Spain and quite possibly the European Union. With more on this, Shoaib Hassan reports. <laughs> These people are incensed at what they say is an attack on Spain's nationhood. And the focus of their wrath is this man, Carlos Puigdemont. He's the head of the Catalan regional government and has refused to back down from a bid for independence. Para eso cuenten con nosotros. Pero no cuenten para ningún simulacro. Ninguna maniobra de dilación ni ninguna escenificación de falsa voluntad de diálogo. Nada que les permita creer que renunciamos a nuestro derecho a la autodeterminación. It all began in 2014, when a consultative ballot was carried out by the government of then-Catalonian leader, Artur Mas. 
asking voters if the region should push for full independence. The result was a resounding yes. Over 80% voted in favour. But Spain's central government, led then by current Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy, completely dismissed the exercise, calling it a political ploy. More importantly, the country's main constitutional court ruled that polling was against an earlier order. It had said the referendum was in breach of the constitution. Arthur Mas has since stepped down and is currently on trial for carrying out the ballot despite the court order. He remains defiant and the case has become a rallying cry for the separatist movement. And President Puigdemont has now committed to a formal referendum in September this year, but the central government says first there must be a debate on the issue in Parliament. Catalonia is the second largest of Spain's 17 autonomous regions, but is the largest contributor to the economy, making up 20% of Spain's GDP. That's equivalent to $224 billion a year. Its claim to fame includes being the country's industrial hub, as well as home to its best beaches and the world-famous Barcelona football club. Despite this contribution, many Catalonians feel that their culture and language are not given enough importance by the central government. And they also feel federal enclave Madrid is given preferential treatment in terms of development funds, despite Catalonia's much greater contribution to the national exchequer. That's a particularly bitter pill to swallow, and it's fueled the push for full autonomy. That set the stage for the biggest political confrontation since Spain's civil war in the 1930s, when Catalonia was the last region to fall to the fascists, fighting to the bitter end. Will they succeed this time, where once they had failed? Shweb Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Barcelona is Adria Alsina. He's with the Catalan National Assembly and a professor at the University of Victoria. And from Oxford, Joan Yorak. He's a Spanish author who's written extensively on the reasons against Catalan independence. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Adria, let me begin with you. Why now? Why is this the time for Catalan independence? You have a vibrant Catalan identity. You're in, you know, Spain, your, the economy is not doing too well, but there's a fair amount of autonomy. Why now? Well, now it's not exactly the moment for independence, but it's the moment for a referendum. Uh, the Catalan government has been asking for a referendum for the past uh, four to five years. Uh, two years ago, a coalition of parties who proposed of a referendum for uh, Catalonia on independence. Uh, they won the election, and uh, so now they're just fulfilling their mandate. So it's not about whether it's time or not, it's whether uh, the people of Catalonia want it or not, and they've demonstrated uh, widely that they want to hold a referendum. Whether or not they want independence or not, that's mm -hmm. up to the result of the referendum itself. Okay, so Joan, is that fair? I mean, give them a referendum, well, I, I hear what they have to say. Well, I think that's not exactly the case. Um, the parties in favor of independence uh, proposed that the last election would be the substitute of a referendum. And they got less than 48% of the vote. And in their platform, they didn't have a referendum of independence. They did have a referendum to validate the constitution that would be done after independence had been won at the election. And the election, on their own terms, wasn't won. Joan, the president of the Catalonia regional government, do you think he is being self-serving here? Well, I think he has a deep desire, as many other leaders in favor of independence, that since very early on in their lives, they have a desire for uh, independent Catalonia. And they honestly believe it is the best for the future of Catalonia. I mean, they do believe it. Do you think it would have terrible ramifications, Joan, if they have a referendum and they say yes? How's that going to affect Madrid? Well, for me, a yes would be exactly, would have the same effect that Brexit may have in, in the UK. Um, that's why I'm um, against the referendum, because it would be gambling the future the same way that David Cameron 
gamble the future of the UK. And now pretty much everyone agrees that his decision to hold a referendum was a mistake. I mean, from people at the very left, like Owen Jones, to the very right, like John Major, they all say, look, I mean, uh, the, uh, Cameron has been one of the worst prime ministers okay. precisely for his decision to hold the referendum. OK, so Adria, so, is sorry, that? Uh, did, did, I just, did I just understand that Mr. Dorak is saying that everyone agrees that holding a referendum on Brexit was a huge mistake and that everybody agrees on it? Because, I mean, they are going to a new election and uh, well, I think that British people have to validate whether it was a good decision or not to uh, hold a referendum. I don't, I don't think it's up to Mr. Dorak to judge whether it was a good decision to hold a referendum or not. The party who proposed the referendum is on course to win this election. So um, I, I think it's a bit, a bit too much to say that everybody agrees it was a huge mistake to hold that referendum. OK, John, so it's, is that why Prime Minister Mariano you, Rajoy is, is playing hardball with the Catalan independence movement. Is that why he doesn't want to compromise at all? Because he doesn't want to be remembered as David Cameron? That's one side. And the other side, because he's tied by our constitution, which is, say, equivalent to the Italian constitution. And three years ago, the Parliament of Veneto also approved a law to organize a referendum of independence in Veneto. And one year later, the Constitutional Court of Italy ruled that the referendum could not be organized simply because it was unconstitutional. So Spain is in the same situation as the United States or Italy, in which, unless you change the Constitution, a referendum of independence cannot be done. Okay, Adria, this is the Constitution. Let me, let me just say something first. It, it, just. Coming back to, to, to the UK, it's sure. funny how Mr. Llorac uh, was first using only uh, party leaders, party elites, uh, whereas it seems like the, the people in the UK are pretty happy with having voted for and against Brexit. But uh, let's set that aside. It's also interesting how Mr. Llorac is trying to associate us to uh, movements like, like the Brexit, whereas uh, referendums, historic referendums in uh, nations that had movements uh, that proposed independence, like in Quebec or Scotland, what, have, what right. history shows us is that when you actually propose a referendum, the, the country that proposes it, the, pro the country that accepts it, is very likely to uh, keep together. Okay, uh, whereas so, when you so don't let me ask you, Adria, it, that it's very sure, likely to it's, break. I'm apart. happy you brought up Scotland because. The Scots eventually, when push came to shove, they decided they want to be a part of a bigger tent. That might change down the line, but when they had that vote in 2014, they decided decisively to stay within the UK. Are you willing to accept that if there's a vote, those in Catalonia go, OK, fine, we want to be a part of Spain. You'll put this aside for the foreseeable future then? Sure, but, the, but this is, not, this is yeah. not the matter right now. The matter right now is that there's a government and there's a parliament, a parliamentary majority in Catalonia that is proposing a referendum and has proposed it repeatedly and, then, uh, and is willing to negotiate and compromise. Right. And then there's another side in Madrid, the president of the government in Madrid, that is just saying just what Mr. Llorac was saying. It's unconstitutional. All right, hey, let's even assume it's unconstitutional. All right. Do you want to change the Constitution? Do you want to make it possible? Mm -hmm. To me, at least, I think parties, politicians are there to make things possible, okay, to make so things good feasible. Point. And before not, we go back to, to Joan... Not shield sure. yourself... Sure, good point. Before yeah, we go back to Joan... Not just shield yourself behind the Constitution. Right, OK. So you mentioned Scotland, and I want to finish off with Scotland here. I want to, I want to, to help understand the movement a bit better. The Scots decided they love Europe, or the SNP, rather, those who want to break away. They love Europe but they don't like the UK, so they want to stay in Europe, but they want to break away from the UK. That's the SNP. Is that what it's like in, in Catalonia as well with you? I think it's a very interesting uh, comparison because it's very, it's very similar. The Scots indeed chose to stay in the UK when the UK accepted them as a nation, a nation that had the power to decide whether to live or to stay. And then uh, many Scots seem to have changed their mind when the UK took a decision that was 
that basically broke the constitutional pact or the agreement between the, the two nations, which was deciding to leave the European Union, which is something that uh, a, a majority in, this, in Scotland don't want. It's very, it's very similar to what, uh, to what happened in, in Spain. In 2010, the Constitutional Court decided that there was no room for more autonomy for Catalonia, not even more room for more right. autonomy, but the, uh, that the autonomy in Catalonia should be cut back. So therefore, there's a clear violation of the Constitutional Pact. There's a clear uh, breakout with uh, what we all agreed okay. for, well, we, we all agreed uh, with. And, and therefore, the Catalans are uh, slowly uh, choosing and changing their minds. And uh, why not try it alone? Okay. And stay let, let me within ask the European Union directly. Sure, let me ask Joanne. So you mentioned the Constitution. From me trying to read up on this story, a lot of people who are anti-Catalan independence, you know, mention the Constitution as well. There was even the possibility, it says, the Spanish government could activate Article 155 of the Constitution, suspending Catalan autonomy if this referendum goes forward. Is there the possibility of that? And, and is Madrid really, you know, thinking about maybe risking a lot of trouble, maybe even violence by doing that? just to teach Catalonia a lesson? Well, yeah, that's I totally think that undesirable. Madrid, um, no. uh, oh. Let Joan have, have, a, have a go at this. Joan? Okay. Yes, so it's totally unde undesirable. And that is an article that we actually copied from the German constitution. So it's always right there. So just in case if you have a governor of a state that is not fulfilling the constitution to have a mechanism to act. So it's something that is standard practice in the constitutions, and that I'm sure everyone is willing to avoid at any cost. OK. OK, gentlemen, unfortunately, I've got to wrap because you'll be dropping off the air soon. But it's been a pleasure getting a taste of the story with both of you, Adria Alsina and Joanne Yorak. Thanks for joining us. Brazil's indigenous tribes are a proud people. They fought for decades to keep their customs and their way of life. But their toughest battle yet is over land. Armed with arrows and carrying symbolic coffins, protesters recently stormed Brazil's Congress after lawmakers called for a shutdown of the Indian Affairs Agency, the only body that protects indigenous land rights in the country. Brazil has around 900,000 indigenous people from hundreds of different tribes living in 690 territories, mainly in the Amazon. But indigenous tribes only occupy 1.5% of that land. Some lawmakers argue that's a waste of space. They also say that FUNAI, Brazil's Indian Affairs Agency, often champions illegal land claims. Brazil's government had recently slashed the agency's funding by 40 percent and fired FUNAI's president when he condemned the cuts. Brazil's weak economy is partly to blame. But despite suffering the worst recession on record, agricultural production is booming and it's come at a high cost. From sweeping deforestation and logging to large-scale cattle farming, Brazil is seeing its biggest rollback of environmental and indigenous protections in two decades. But conservative Congressman Nilson Leitao says, Funai has been overprotective. There are Indians who may want to become miners and producers, and they should have the freedom to decide. The Indians might be living on a big mine, and their people are starving. If these Brazilian politicians succeed in changing the laws to allow mining on indigenous territories, for example, or to allow roads to be built through them, or military bases to be built in them, or all sorts of other things, or if they, can, they succeed in changing the process of mapping out the land, that spells disaster for tribes across the country. For Brazil's native groups, the fight over land has reignited a war they long thought was over a battle for survival. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers.
What I see here before me, in this hall, is the potential of our country, here together with foundations upon which we can build our dream of peace. All who are participating in this conference enjoy the privilege of and bear the responsibility for turning the dream we so long cherished into reality. Some of Myanmar's ethnic groups have been fighting a deadly war against the government for more than 70 years. The country's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, is hoping that a new round of talks can result in a lasting peace agreement. Hundreds of representatives from different rebel groups have flocked to the capital, Napiador, for a five-day conference. It's taking place amidst months of renewed conflict and little progress from the first time they met. And some of the country's largest armed groups are not even there. And critics say Suu Kyi is too close to the military to gain the trust of the rebels. Well, let's cross over to Napier and talk to Oliver Slow. He's the chief of staff at uh, the news website, uh, news website Frontier Myanmar. Thanks so much for joining us, Oliver. Is that true? Is she too close to the military in order to be uh, someone the rebels can trust? I think it's certainly regarded that way. Um, I think when, when her NLD party won the election back in November 2015, we saw those scenes of jubilation, of excitement, and there was certainly hope at the time that she'd be able to make a lot of progress on this peace process. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be the case. The peace process seems to be going backwards. She's regarded, if you speak to most of these ethnic minority groups, uh, she's seen as being too close to the military. Um, she, she doesn't speak out if they, if, when they launch attacks, it's certainly in the north of the country. Uh, she seems to scold some of these ethnic groups for not signing an agreement that they don't essentially agree with. So, yeah, I think it's a fair assessment to say that um, there's a lot of distrust still of herself and the central government. Mm -hmm. She had a stain on her credibility because of, I guess, failing to talk out, uh, to speak out about what was happening to the vulnerable Rohingya. Uh, internationally, she lost mm -hmm. a lot of political capital, a lot of the prestige. But she still has a lot of international allies. People want Myanmar to do well. They want her to do well. But does the international community maybe underestimate just how many unresolved ethnic tensions there are in this country and just how many armed groups there are? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, this country, it, it was only, you know, it was military dictatorship just five years ago. Not just, it has so many issues to overcome of 60, 70 years of military rule. Um, one of those is what's happening in Rakhine State, as you mentioned. One of those is the economy. And the other one is, yes, 70 years of um, distrust of the central government. Um, as you say in your intro, a lot of these groups have been fighting with the government for 70 years. Um, and they simply just, many of them don't trust this process. I think there's been a little bit of pro um, movement forward in some areas. Some of the smaller groups, such as the Korean National Union, they signed the agreement back in 2015. Yeah. But since then, really, there hasn't been any major victory for the peace process. And as I say, it appears to be going backwards at the moment. Yeah, doing my research, so I'm, I'm looking, you know, you have the Northwest Rakhine State, the horrendous situation, horrendous situation there, you know, with, with the Rohingya fleeing mm -hmm. to Bangladesh and so on. The Northeast flaring up. Uh, what's the most volatile flashpoint out of all of these right now? Well, the, the, both those places have the potential to flare up. Rakhine, the, what's happening in Rakhine State is, is separate to what's happening in the peace process. Um, that security clearance operation has apparently ended, but we're, we're keeping a close eye on what's happening there because, because of what's been happening in the past few months. Um, with regards to the northeast of the country, there's many different pockets of, of fighting that's been happening, particularly in the last year. Uh, one of the, a big change happened around November, December, with, when a new coalition of groups calling themselves uh, the Northern Alliance launched attacks on the um, on Tamador outposts up in northern Shan State. Mm -hmm. The Northern Alliance is a coalition of four groups uh, who have been in conflict with the Tamador for a long time, and that spilled over once again in March in Kokang region. So. I think, to be honest, it has the potential to flare up in, in many different areas, and we've just got to keep a close eye on it. Yeah, all, all across the borders, on all parts of the country. I was reading a report by the Heinrich Boel Foundation, and the headline was, Myanmar's religious and ethnic conflicts, no end in sight. And he goes on to say, since August 2016, old conflicts have erupted anew and become more virulent, especially in the north and the east of the country. And it's, re it's kind of interesting because... When, when I was reading this, it, it almost suggested, when I read the rest of the report, it suggested that the military dictatorship kept a lid on, on some of this and that the opening up of the, of the country almost flared up some of it. it is that true? Um, I think, I mean, if you, if you look at, for example, what's happening with regards to the prevalence of hate speech, in particular against the Muslim minority, 
Uh, that, that increased hugely when uh, telecommunications in, uh, came online. For, for many, many years, people in Myanmar couldn't, could have basically couldn't use the internet because it was too expensive, it was too slow. Um, and then in 2013, that changed when international players came in. And now, while that's been certainly had a good side in many ways, what we've seen, the dark, darker side of that is the increase in hate speech, um, which has contributed to a lot of tension, particularly between uh, Buddhist and Muslim communities here. So is there an increase in a kind of an aggressive Buddhist nationalism at play? It's certainly become more prevalent. Uh, we have movements like the Madhata, uh, Uraratu, the infamous monk. Um, and I think there is an issue with that, that anti-Muslim um, sentiment does appear to be bubbling on the surface. Whether that existed under the military regime, we just simply don't know. Right. But it has been given um, more of a platform now. So you have the NLD in power, you have Aung San Suu Kyi, and as we mentioned, Earlier on, some of the rebel groups don't even want to show up because they don't trust her. She's got the Nobel Prize for, for peace. If not her, then who? Is there any uniting factor in this country? I, th I think they need the, the NLD needs to breed, or the, whatever leader in this country, is to breed a new generation of leaders. And there are, there's a wonderful civil society in this country, but they are being ignored in almost every facet of this country's development. Um, we, we make the case that the NLD needs to breed a new generation of leaders. Uh, yeah, there's many young people who support Aung San Suu Kyi, who fight for, you know, who fight for religious tolerance, who want this peace process to come to an end, but they're not being given a voice at the table. You look at all the people in the discussions today, and, and many of them are sort of 50, 60, 70 years old. They've had the same mindset for 20, 30 years. So to be optimistic, we have to hope that in the next sort of generation coming through the next few years, there is, this new generation will be able to, to have a voice, to be able to talk about issues um, that are affecting this country. And, and all those rebel groups, are their leaders also sort of old school? Many of them are, yeah. You look at, for example, the Karen, that many of these have sort of been around for a long, long time. Um, same with regards to the, the United Wars, State Army, the Kachir. Um, so yeah, it's a similar mindset sort of across the board. Yeah, and Oliver, if you don't mind me asking you a very broad question now, almost vaguely related to, to some of the stuff we've been talking about, what's the most uh, misunderstood aspect of, of Myanmar? that uh, outsiders get wrong? It's uh, a very good question. I think um, the whole message about Myanmar for so many years was a very simple one. It was the bad men in green being the military and the good people of the country, particularly the lady in red, Aung San Suu Kyi. The reality is, like many places, the country is much more complex than that. Uh, the NLD had some good points. It has some good leaders. It has some good politicians who are really trying to make calls. But there are some who... Um, perhaps don't hold the democratic ideals that we hope they'd have, that perhaps in the mindset is the past. So I think it's just that this country is much, much more complex than many people have come to understand it. How far is it from an inclusive democracy, do you think? An inclusive democracy, do you mean a, a peace process? Yeah, a peace process where everybody feels included. A long, long way off, unfortunately, I think. Um, I think there needs to be a kind of, it's, it's, at a, it's at a point at the moment, it's at a crossroads, the peace process, and I think it needs, it needs a complete change. Uh, when, there needs to be a shift in mindsets. It's a very, very complex um, situation with many you know, natural resources, things to think about. You have the influence of China up in the north, so there's many, many different aspects. And I think to be realistic, we won't see an end to a real end to the peace process for, for quite, quite a number of years. Okay, all of slow. It's, it's good to get a deeper dive in Naputo with you. Thanks so much for helping us understand what's going on. Thank here. you very much. Iran had an election last weekend where 41 million voters, or 73% of the electorate, chose to give the president a second term. President Hassan Rouhani. They call him a moderate. Reformist. He's the guy who calls for more civil liberties, the man who struck a deal with former U.S. President Obama to curb his country's nuclear program in exchange for easing of sanctions. He got 56% of the votes. But listen, this was a sham election. May I remind you, Iran has a history of human rights violations, a state where the theocrats have immense power. Iran supports Syria's Bashar al-Assad. It sends militias into neighboring countries. Though the turnout was massive and endorsement of Rouhani was huge, we are warned that the Iranian people actually reject this election. That was from the American thinker. Those millions have only humiliated themselves in this sham election. Rouhani, 
is a fake reformer in a fake election. This election is in no way an example of the people actually choosing the most moderate candidate on offer to try to push the country in a different direction. All candidates have to be approved by an unelected guardian council. The president doesn't have the real power in the country anyway. That belongs to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, a theocratic dictator who was actually publicly backing the defeated candidate, a hardliner called Raisi. He needs to up his dictator game. Yes, Rouhani might have said our nation's message in the election was clear. Iran's nation chose the path of interaction with the world away from violence and extremism. But why should we believe him? He duped those young people. Think of this, this one guy called Abraham Lincoln. He was running for president as a so-called reformist in the US election in 1860. It was a country where women couldn't vote and slavery was not only practiced, but an integral part of the society. In that election, Lincoln suggested as a reformist that while he doesn't like slavery, he wouldn't do away with it immediately. He wanted to put a hold on the institution in the newly acquired territories as a start. He upset the hardliners and the true reformers. Don't listen to me. Listen to black abolitionists from Illinois, H. Ford Douglas, who said at the time, I do not believe in the anti-slavery of Abraham Lincoln. He is on the side of this slave power, of which I am speaking, that has possession of the federal government. Fake reformer in a fake election in 1860. So, rather than all these sham elections, maybe Iran's rotten system needs to be overthrown by outside forces. Then the forces of democracy can militarily occupy the place, settle it down for a bit before overseeing real free and fair elections. It worked in Iraq, didn't it? That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Gavda. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.